Hey guys, it's Bella and this week we're going to look at the Proto-Gothic script or the Littera Pre-Gothica. Now for this script you can use the Paleography of Gothic Manuscript Books by Albert Derelez as your main textbook as opposed to the Latin Paleography Antiquity and the Middle Ages textbook by Bernard Bischoff which would be your main textbook for the other scripts we've been doing so far because it goes into more detail than what I'm giving you in these lectures or what you can find in Bernard Bischoff's textbook. So, before we do Proto-Gothic script, it's worth looking at Littera Carolingiana Cursiva or Caroline Minuscule script. So, Littera Carolingiana Cursiva or Caroline Minuscule script was a script developed at Charlemagne's court in the 9th century and it soon spread around Europe. It was used for all sorts of purposes regardless of how prestigious the text was and its main distinguishing features are the introduction of a small rounded unseal A, having a looped G and a straight backed D, the use of a rounded nib and a general lack of serifs at the end of pen strokes, a, call, a tall cursive S distinguished from R in height and the shape of a shoulder stroke, and they regularized the abbreviations for UR and US, looking like a two and a, a tilde above the letters respectively, and also by using generally fewer ligatures than most minuscule scripts. So this is an example of what Caroline Minuscule is like. You can see the um, unseal A, but you can also see more open varieties. You can see the tall back D, you can see the, the tall S in the third row there, and at the bottom you can see some of the common ligatures that they would use in Carolingian scripts, such as the e caudata in particular, in the bottom left hand corner. Here is an example of Carolingian script, and the astute among you will notice that the top line is actually not in Carolingian script, but it is in Littera, uh, Littera Romana Rusticana, so it is uh, Roman, rustic Roman capitals. and. If we were to read the Carolingian script, it says Victoris Pro, because that's a, um, an abbreviation for Pro, Victoris Pro laud Laude Necer Necesse, I think. There's an abbreviation above the EM. Festiva Cruenta Funeris Affectus et laman Lamentabile Votum coniugis iliacenam que jugula retaridem aurea regularde regular uti lantia seria cruore et diadema ducisse datum taber tabe cerebrum to be honest, I'm not fully certain what this is. It's quite difficult for me to understand, but um, there you go. That's what it is. Um, we need a bit of history for context about the Renaissance. So, greater contact with the Islamic world following the Crusades caused what some historians have called a 12th century Renaissance. And the principal impact on writing and education was the introduction to Western Europe by a Latin translations from Arabic translations of pagan ancient Greek works of philosophy such as Plato. In addition to the Greek, many Arabic concepts and words such as numerals entered the Western world at this time, although they wouldn't become commonplace until the Gothic era proper, which is going to be covered in next week's lecture. The 12th century stands at a sort of intersection of different methods of learning. Western Europe was transitioning away from leaning on the verse-centred Lectio, which is described by Hugh St. Victor in his treatise The Didascalion. It's, Europe is transitioning from this Lectio method of learning to the encyclopedic approach to using books as sort of storehouses of knowledge. And this is where we get to the early development of Proto-Gothic script. So Proto-Gothic refers to the gradual developments between the well-defined Carolingian script in the 9th century and the emergence of Gothic script in the 13th, so it's a slow evolution of script. In this period, script slowly started to take on some of the later Gothic characteristics. So, and these characteristics are more lozenge-like ends to minimum strokes and descenders, so these like wedges you'll get. Sometimes you get very small serifs forming on descenders, like you'll see more pronounced in later Gothic scripts. The unsealed flat top D becoming more common than its straight counterpart. You have generally thicker quills being used in writing Proto-Gothic. 
and that's probably the most obvious feature on the page that lets you identify it is the use of a thicker quill. In Protogothic, there is a greater tendency for them to form curved letters from straighter strokes rather than using curved strokes of the pen. And also they make heavier use of abbreviations and sigla, especially in certain kinds of texts, such as scientific and legal documents. And lastly, they start to differentiate the U and the V more commonly in Protogothic, whereas they don't in Caroline. Here is an example of Protogothic script. So we can tell that it's Protogothic from I mean, basically how thick it is, um, how thick it is, you can see these small serifs on the bottom of, say, the I. So if I take my cursor and I go here and I go veluti, you can see that there's a little serif coming up there off of the I. You can see that they're forming curved letters such as the N and the U from straight lines that they're connecting rather than through curved strokes of the pen. So to some extent, this is true of the E as well. You can see a, a, a straight line there and a smaller curved line up there. We can also see a fair amount of abbreviation. So here we have animalib and then the sort of semicolon, and that's short for animalibus. We have another abbreviation in summa. Um, we have NRA for nostra, OMIS for omnis, etc. So we have quite a lot of abbreviation in this uh, proto Gothic script and also a, the use of a thinner nib is identifying this to us. Here is another example of um, proto-Gothic script, um, although obviously the um, top two lines are in a weird sort of mix between square capitals and unsealed script. Um, but if I read um, from, if I read from this going into the Proto-Gothic for a couple of lines so you can get a sense of what it's like. Breves temporum per generaciones et reina primus ex nostris Julius Africanus sub imperatore Marco Aurelia, Aurelio Antonino simplicis historiae fallo, falloe liquid. So it's um, short things about short notices about time through the generations and kingdoms um f chief among us julius the african um under the emperor marcus aurelius antonius um permitted um in a simple style in a simple style for these bits of history to be um sorry sorry um he put these forward in a uh simple style and you can see some of the, so some of the proto-Gothic features we can identify are these, again, it's hard to see at such an angle, but these like small serifs at the end of some letters, um, the H starts to loop in a bit on itself and that's more of a proto-Gothic thing. We can see that there's a lot of abbreviation and punctuation. So um, here we have pres PRVT for presbyter, chronicorum, that RUM abbreviation there is quite a Gothic feature that we have. Um, the script also gets a bit more squashed, and that's something that comes to characterise Gothic later on. So these are some of the identifying characteristics that let us tell that something is proto-Gothic. Here is another one, and it's actually the um, oldest charter that they have in the collections of my former uh, college, my uh, alma mater of Magdalene College, Floriat Magdalena. Um, so if I read this out to you, it says, um, Hugo de... Camuilla omnibus hominibus suis godentum et francis et anglicis, qui sunt et qui venturi sunt, salutem. Notum sit vobis, quod quandam aquaram terre de dominio meo cum prato adeandem terram pertinente regnero pictori, in feudum et in hereditatem de edi illi et eredibus suis de me et de eredibus meis tenan tenandam solidam et quietam ab omnibus servicis sextenarius annuatim redendo et per cambitione illius terre quam rogerius frater meus eidonavit illam cinicet acram terre de diei qui est inter domum Edwardi et domum Ricardi de Estunia et Sciendum est quod regnerus propter cartam habendam 
Unum sacardium mi et uxordi mei wimplaria quedam donavit. Is testibus, Ricardo de Camuil, Domina Cristina, Hunfrido clerico, Alardo, Odonne, Filius Reini, et ipso halum alimot, valete. So what this is, it's a charter um, by Hugh of Camilla giving us a, giving some land to this guy called Regnerus. Um, and yeah, this is a, this is a very um, gothic sample. This is basically already gothic. Um, you can see that there are very thick wedges at the, t at the tops of letters and they're starting to curve out a bit in this sort of secretary style that we see more developed in charters and we'll look at that in a second. We can see that letters like the E and the A, they're being formed by these straight lines for the most part. Um, the U as well. The H um, has a descender that's getting quite pronounced now. There's a lot of abbreviations in this um, and it's a rather thick nib that they're using as well. They also have these um, developed gothic capitals that they're using. Um, the, the script is quite squashed and it fits together between the two lines rather nicely. Um, what else are they using? I think we... do we have the rounded S anywhere? We have... yeah, we have the rounded S sometimes, like the MS here. Um, what else, where else do we have it? Um, do we have an or room anywhere that would be quite obviously gothic. Oh, we have a W here in a Wimplaria, the name of his wife. Um, and this is a letter that you don't really see in Carolingian script. You would see two U's written out for W, but you wouldn't see a single letter of W. You can also see in the last line, you can see a distinction between the U and the V because um, it's not consistent, but down at the very last word you see Val, which is short for Valete. Whereas up here, we can see the the, well, we can see in the word Venturi, um, this, although it's pronounced as a V, they're writing it as a U, and here also we have another U, and it's a curved U, just like normal. We can also see these like little ticks, these serifs at the bottom of the I's and the, the N's. These are very gothic features. There's another curved S. Oh, and a flattened G as well. That's quite a gothic thing. And the linking and the biting of letters. So Godendum, uh, do we have any other obvious ones? Frat is kind of biting into each other there. We have, well here we, in the word hereditatem we have words cutting into each other quite a bit. Um, biting letters is quite a gothic feature but it tends not to happen that much in the early stages. We have to, it's when we get gothic proper that this happens. So it's worth talking about the differences between secular scribes versus those working from monastic centres because prior to the 11th century almost all writing was released at ecclesiastical centres. So even kings and lords that are drawing up entirely secular charters, they would have these charters written out, copied and sometimes witnessed by members of the clergy. And therefore it's sometimes possible to identify script styles that are associated with a given monastic scriptorium, such as that of Christchurch Canterbury, and that's, that's one which is particularly well documented, because all the scribes there would undergo the same training, and so they would all write in the same way. In the high medieval period, and this is from the um, 11th to the 13th, 14th century, well to the 13th century, secular writing and education began to flourish, although universities proper wouldn't be established until the Gothic era. However, secular authorities started to employ scribes in order to document various things in this time period, as governments generally became more stable in the high medieval period. Which brings us to the use of proto-Gothic script in government documentation, and this is Litera Pre-Gothica Anglicana, or Secretary Hand. So Litera Pre-Gothica Anglicana is, was known as such because it's a script which began to be used for official documents and charters, and it diverged significantly from the scripts used in book production. And we can identify it as a distinct style because we get many more legal records surviving from the 12th century on. You might remember in one of the earlier paleography videos that we've done on this channel, we talked about how in early medieval England the half, un sorry, the unseal script or half unseal script was used generally for the writing of charters, although at least in earlier centuries, whereas in later centuries you might get um, the use of insular minuscule script for writing charters. Um, and these are the same scripts that are found in other books, but in the, um, from the 12th century on, because you have 
much it seems like a much larger and more consistent production of charters and documents like this we start to get a kind of script that's used in their writing which differs from the main book hands that are being used in the writing of and the copying of other texts such as bibles and scientific works and the features of secretary hand are the increased heights of letters especially ascenders and descenders and especially in the first line which is usually double the height of the rest of the text and these ascenders and descenders they often have these little palm tree like terminals and we'll see what that looks like in a second and they they use a lot of abbreviation because you have stock phrases in charters they're quite formulaic in their language and they often repeat so nobody needs to know um these stereotype legal terms you can just write the first couple of letters and people know what they're talking about and also you get a lot of spacing between lines and the use of w k and z for writing in personal names which are coming from vernacular languages which don't fit as easily into latin so here is an example of some secretary script or some early developments of secretary script in proto-gothic um this is the entry of the town where I grew up, grew up, sorry, in Domesday Book, which I quite like. Um, so if I read from the top here, it says, Ipsa abatia tenet tottinges, this abbacy has in tooting. Sue tenuit de rege erwardus et defendit se pro quatorhidis terve. Est una carta et dimidum, ibi sunt due vila, vilani cum dimidium carta et, et tres acras pa, um, per pasta, pasti, I think that's what it is. So that says this abbacy of Tooting is held in the county of, in the hundred of Brixton. Um, Swain holds held the land in the time of King Edward. These are all abbreviations for so Swain Tenuit, De Rede, and then E for Eduardus, because this name comes up over and over in Domesday Book, um, is given as an abbreviation. This is a Tyrrhonian nota for et, et defendit, and it sort of answers, defendit, say, it, it accounts for pro, there's P with the lines abbreviation, um, for hides, hide is abbreviated, and then terra, um, of land, est is, the land is, una, one, carta, so, and this is a, carta is a measurement of land, so it's a technical term, and therefore they've abbreviated it, and a half, it, dimidus, there's the Tyronean nota again, and then ibi sunt due vilani, vilani is abbreviated again, cum dimidum, that's another one, um, carta, et, Tyronean nota, three acres, and then I think this is a, abbreviation for the word for pasture. Um, so we can see that it's a relatively thin, sorry, thick nib that they're using. Um, we still have the tall S, so this is still quite, this is a very early kind of proto-gothic, but we can see some of the features. So we can see these, um, these interesting shapes, these little lines on the ascenders, which um, evoke the later developments of the palm shapes. We can see the use of um, letters such as W, um, for writing uh, vernacular names and we can see the very heavy use of abbreviation and a relatively large amount of space between the words. The Domesday book isn't a charter but it's written with some of the early features of secretary hand script. Here is another one from Domesday book but we don't need to go into this too much. Um, here is a really classic example of charter script and it just suffices to point out the major features so you can see this first line with really huge ascenders and descenders. I believe that this here, this word here says um, Heinrich or maybe Heinrich, Henrich for King Henrik. Um, sorry, for King Henry. Um, and then you can see that these tall ascenders and descenders are on the lower lines as well. And we can see the very high amounts of abbreviation that they've got going on. This one doesn't have the, um, the descenders and ascenders they end in these very cute little um, ampersands basically doesn't it? look at this the little curls at the top rather than the palm trees and i quite like this feature on this one although it's not the most common um and here's another example um do we have the palm tree like ascenders on this one i don't think we do but we can see a lot of the same um 
features we can see the use of letters like w for um vernacular names we can see very heavy amount of abbreviation um a lot of space between the lines to accommodate for these relatively tall ascenders and descenders um oh i wish we oh maybe there's here we are um so here we we can see these palm tree like shapes at the ends um this one also does the loops for some of these letters instead of the palm tree like thing um but we can see it on one of them at least in the first letter p and these are petitionibus um according to or by the petitions and you can see also that the first line is much enlarged it's bigger than the others um and yeah these are this is a good illustration of what charters will look like um if i read the first line it's maybe not too clear in the video but um it says petitionibus justius Ascensum devote in pendimus et ea que ad prefectum et monumentum ordini vestro et sancto proposito esse possunt libenter concedimus. So by the um, just petent by just petitions, um, we have um, granted. Uh, we have devotingly granted assent so that those things which um are at for the um perfection and benefit of our order and of the holy proposition laid out um at, which were placed for the holy proposition um may be generous or freely granted by us so it's the king sort of saying that in response to petitions um is going to freely grant the, what these people have asked for for the sake of their order um and a common feature in this is because the language is very formulaic they will just repeat themselves over and over again with these grandiose titles that i am the king of so and so with all of these titles um just a quick note that you can see the palm like tree like um ascenders tops of the ascenders in the w up there as well so that's basically it um there's just a couple of interesting little manuscripts that i want to show you because i like them um here is germany weisbaden uh hessische landesbibliothek uh ms hs2 folio 461v if you want to look it up and this is the manuscript that contains Hildegard von Bingen's Lingua Ignota. It's the earliest recorded constructed language that we have record of, and it is where she describes it, and it's written in this very, very late form of proto-Gothic. It's basically Gothic. Um, and I'll read out from the red what it says. Um, Ignota lingua per simplicem hominem Hildegarde prolata, which means the unknown language laid out by a simple person, Hildegard. Because um, it's worth noting that homin, homo is, in medieval Latin, a rather, rather generic word for person. It's sort of gender neutral. So Hildegard is, is referring to herself almost with a gender neutral pronoun, almost. Um, so this script, as you can see, it's, it's got sometimes the um, the rounded S, though generally it prefers the tall S. Well, actually, no, it's so it's got a mix, I'd say, of the tall and rounded S. It's got a rather thick nib, um, but it still has the um, it still has the Carolingian tall A as opposed to the more rounded A that comes in in Gothic. Um, and there's not too many abbreviations, although that's maybe to be expected. Um, and just as an interesting thing here, we have the words in her language in the bigger text below, and she gives a gloss of what they mean in Latin. And we have inimois for homo, for person, iur for man, via, and then vanex for femina or woman. And notice that they have a distinction between a v and a u, because this is quite a late form of proto-Gothic text. So now you've learned three words in the first constructed language of all time you're welcome here are the letters of her lingua ignota and we don't need to go into it obviously um, but there you go it's also a good illustration of very late proto-gothic lettering so
There you go. Um, this is a really metal text that I deal with a lot in my um, PhD research because it's um, often a company accompanies combatistical texts, and it's a, it's called the sphere of life and death. Um, and it's basically a way that you can tell if somebody is going to die from an illness that they've got. And if I read it out, it says, De qua cumbre shire volueres vel consulere, ut puta de egris qua dies occurrerit ea die, et quata luna fuerit cum puta, et ade nomen eus secundum literas infrascriptas, et sic in uno collegis, et partire per triginta, et quicquid in sferda remanserit, and it continues. Um, so what this says is, basically you add up the name, each person, letter of a person's name is assigned a numerical value, you add these up, and you add also the no, the number of the moon in which they got sick, so like the stage of the moon's growth on the day they got sick, and you divide all of this by 30, and you look for the number that will remain in the sphere, and if it's in the top half of the sphere, then the person will live, and if it's in the bottom half, then they're going to die. It's quite dramatic stuff. Here is another interesting uh, proto-Gothic one, again, quite a late sample. Um, you can see we have the um, Aurum uh, abbreviation here, which is a sign that's quite late. Um, this one doesn't seem to have the curved S all that much, um, and it doesn't have that many abbreviations, but it has a rather thick nib, so that's a good sign that we are um, getting close to the Gothic era proper, and it's early 12th century, you know, it's get getting on there. And what's interesting about this is that it is the oldest, the second oldest, rather, historical account of the legendary King Arthur. Um, where is his name in this text? Um, yes. Uh, Tunc Arthur punyabat contra illos milis, milis diebus cum redibus Britonum. Um, then Arthur was fighting against them for thousands of days with the kings of the Britons. Um, say, I think this is, um, say, ipse, dux erat bellorum. He indeed was the lord of wars, which is quite a cool, um, a cool title for King Arthur. And here is another one in a Welsh chronicle. Um, we can tell this is pretty gothic because of the thick nib. It it has a fair bit of abbreviation as well. Um, it doesn't have the rounded S yet. It doesn't have some of the gothic features. Um, but we can see we're starting to get these um, little flicks at the end of minims, but not consistently. So we're not fully into the proto-gothic sorry, into the Gothic era yet, and we also have a fair bit of space still between the lines. Um, so I will leave it at this point. Um, this has been a brief examination of proto-Gothic scripts, um, and then next week we will see the full picture. We will see the, the proper Gothic era, which is one of the most important eras in many medieval manuscript studies. So um, I'll see you guys then, and thank you for watching. Bye!